Hi, I'm Lawrence Akers and welcome to OutThink. When I first started OutThink towards the end of 2016, I had real hopes of being able to produce a podcast that exposed different issues around mental health and wellness and how it impacted on the LGBTQIA community. Obviously, I wanted it to be heard. However, the real purpose of these podcasts was help people share their stories and their knowledge. If it was their stories, you would often hear the emotional journey that they had gone on and what their insights had brought to their awareness as a result. If it was a specialist in the area, you could hear the passion as they shared their knowledge and understand why it is they've come to become an expert in that space. In both instances, it was always a thrill for me personally to be able to sit with these people, to take up some of their valuable time, and to be able to create this vehicle that could help share what they knew with the world. Since our thing started, I've received messages and emails from people globally who have wanted to reach out and offer their thoughts, which has been extremely gratifying for a podcast that is still rather small, still finding its feet, but hopefully still growing in the right direction. And there can be a lot of work placed into each episode of our thing, from finding people to speak with, coordinating the right times and means, recording it, editing it, uploading it, promoting it. It really is a non-stop work in progress. The payoff comes from the feedback and comments that indicate something has been shared in an episode that meant something to some person out there. And right now we're still in the process of approaching, organising and recording people for this series. I've always said that if you have a story you would like to share, then I encourage you to drop me a line as I'd love to hear it. Today though, we're talking with Daniel Whithouse. Now, Daniel has been someone I've been watching for a while now. And I think his work is truly extraordinary. You know, he's an author, he's a speaker, he's the founder and CEO of the National Institute for Challenging Homophobia Education, or NICHE. I think most impressively, though, and largely due to his ambition, his tenacity, uh, Daniel went around Australia to remote communities everywhere, aiming to challenge and change homophobic views, and to insist those local communities develop resources to support regional LGBTQIA people. And he did this in his own words, one cupper at a time, which kind of, I think, highlights just how grounded and down to earth this this man actually is. So I also have to say that it was also my first interview back in some time. So I certainly felt a bit rusty in this one. However, Daniel proved to be such a gracious guest who certainly had a lot of insight to say. So with that, welcome back to OutThink and welcome to our chat with Daniel Whithouse. Daniel, welcome today. Thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Now, Daniel, you've been working within the LGBT community, particularly in rural and and out remote areas now for a good couple of decades. Yeah, two decades and and counting, yes. (laughs) So what is like life for LGBT people out in those rural areas? Well, I think that um, having, having worked for two decades in this area, what what strikes me is that that life is changing out there mm. in not only regional, rural, and remote areas, but also in outer metropolitan areas. So I think um, you know the, the the narrative from you know twenty twenty five years ago was that um, you know you have a town full of rednecks. Someone wants to be themselves; they can't, so they have to basically escape to the big smoke. Um, and you know we've heard we've heard plenty of those stories but i think in the last five to ten years what i've heard more of um are, are these people who are saying um everything might not necessarily be perfect in my town um but i want to stay here and i hate the fact that people believe that i should have to move to a metropolitan center in order to have all the things that i require and need and and want and desire um so for me it's a changing story um but you know, I, I think we'll you know unpack this um, over time. Is is that it's really a tale of two experiences in regional, rural, and remote Australia. Mm-hmm. If you are linked in, if you're connected, if you're supported, um, if you have access to a whole range of resources, life in regional, rural, and remote Australia can be fantastic for LGBTI people. Yep. Um, 
if you don't, we still to this day have people believing that they are the only gay in the village, so to speak. And and even more so what I've been hearing um, through my travels is there are still people who are who believe that they're LGBTI friendly voices. Um, and and they they say, I feel like I'm the only LGBTI friendly voice in the village. And so my work is really about uh, getting to those people um, and seeing, uh, you know, seeing how we can make sure that they benefit from all of these great things that we know rural, you know, and regional communities can provide. Mm. I think there is that stereotype out there, as you said, about the redneck and, and it being very blinkered attitudes towards LGBT community. In your experience, what are the attitudes really like out there and what are some of the challenges that the LGBT community face? Look, I I think that the, the, the top issues that people talk to me about when I go to these communities will be um, feeling that they have a lack of visibility, mm -hmm. um, feeling like they have a lack of access to things like, you know, like doctors or LGBTI friendly safe spaces. Um, and so that they'll, they'll talk about feeling that they don't have um, safe spaces to be themselves mm -hmm. and that they have to make compromises and negotiate, you know, public you know, public spaces in order to be themselves. So that is, um, you know, they, they might not necessarily be skipping down the street or they might not necessarily be holding hands with their partner or they, they might think about the way they dress, the way they walk, the way they talk. Um, that's not to say that they don't have stories of acceptance and support within that town. Um, but, but what people talk about is this, you know, uh, um, the attitudes and the, and the stories that I hear, I hear in, you know, from, from Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane as well. I think the difference that people describe in country towns is they talk about like this rural spotlight that burns brightly. So everybody knows everybody. You're one step removed from everybody. Um, everybody talks in town. So yep. therefore you have this like public gaze, you have this, this intense spotlight burning upon yeah. you. And so people say, look, when I'm not feeling necessarily comfortable in my skin and I'm still working it out, I'm not sure how other people will take it. They start second guessing themselves. And that's the difference between, um, you know, a rural and regional centre and somewhere like a metropolitan centre is that there's nowhere to hide. Right. And that's yeah. often what people will talk about. And so if they talk about wanting to move away, it's often because they want to go away to work it out without that rural spotlight burning brightly upon them. Um, and then, you know, they may or may not come back. But but certainly what they say is, is that um, there's, there's, there's nowhere to hide. Um, and um, whereas in the city, you might encounter those experiences but you'd still know you know I, I remember i was talking to um a group of young people in sydney so i was lucky enough to drive around the country and everywhere i went they said look you know we wish that we were like sydney but we can't be we don't have everything that sydney does i was speaking to a group of lgbti young people and i said look help me help me understand around the country people wish that they were in sydney because they say that it's so friendly and it's so accepting and so supportive Help me, help me understand why you need a support group for young people in this day and age. And one young man said it best. And he said, he said, um, I know that regardless, like, you know, everything's not a cakewalk. It's not all glitter and rainbows for me. But I know in Sydney that I'm only one bus ride or train ride away from a safe place, from Oxford Street, from a mm. whole bunch of, you know, like organisations and bars and, you know, all those signs of hope. Um, and that's, I think, what rural and regional people don't have is that they don't have that it's only half an hour to an hour away and I can be safe and I can be myself and I can be with my tribe. Yeah, exactly. And I think, uh, like, I mean, that sense of having a connection with your tribe is really what provides that sense of community. And it would be so much harder when they're feeling like the only the only gay in the village, as the saying goes, and that sense of paranoia that you you may have from knowing that everyone's talking. How do they build a sense of community in in those areas, or at least feel that they belong to LGBT community in, the, in those areas? Look, look. Sometimes, sometimes I think um, you know it's with a little bit of luck. Um, you know, like I, the, the people who who make their way through regional and rural life. Um, they tend to wear a couple of different hats. So, so one of the things that people will talk about is they'll, they'll say, look, in rural communities, there's so many benefits. Um, you know, people will talk about all the benefits and, you know, you can, you can be, you don't have to worry about traffic and you can be connected with everybody in your community and you can, you know, contribute, etc. And what I, stories of LGBTI people who are struggling in regional and rural areas, often it's about 
they don't um, participate in the same way as everybody else. So because of the homophobia, transphobia, whatever they might be facing, um, it leads them to withdraw and not contribute and participate. Well, I'd say they, they wouldn't participate. And what that means is they don't, they don't have the same opportunities to contribute. And towns feel this really, really strongly. So if, um, if you're, if you're, you know, involved with sport and, you know, involved with the local, like some of the clubs or services or whatever it is in your scene and you're participating, um, people notice that mm. and people start to say, well, you're contributing to this community. So therefore I'll forgo some of your, and they might say things like eccentricities or whatever that might be. Um, and LGBTI people who I see thriving will just go stuff all of you I have the right to participate and I have the right to contribute and I have things to offer to this town. Right. And then the town says, oh my goodness, they're, they're, they're amazing. Their color, their movement, they're so refreshing. It's, 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 you know, they're so different. Mm -hmm. Um, but it actually, that, that, that's an LGBTI person doing that in spite of the environment and not yeah. because of it. Um, so if anything, um, you know, the stories of people who do navigate that will be, a little bit of luck, perhaps family and friends and all the rest of it. But, it, but you know, that, that, that's a tale of, you know, I think we could unpack that in another podcast is around privilege. So, you know, ha, you know, your education, your connections, um, people will talk about, you know, if you come from a foundational family in a rural center, um, so therefore families that have been known in the, you know, in the, the particular area. Um, and all of those things obviously give you a little bit more of a leg up. Yeah. Um, the other thing of people who do well is if you're a good doctor, doctor or a good teacher, or you provide a business that's really important to the town, mm -hmm. that will make a that will make a big difference too. Um, in 2010, you you made a really brave move there to travel around Australia, uh, and in your own words, to to have conversations one cup at a time. I imagine that would have been a really incredible experience. What drove you? Uh, excuse the pun, but what yeah. drove you there to? to go and do that. Yeah, look, I, I'd i been um, lucky enough to, you know, I'd been working for about, um, you know, 14, 15 years in the space um, of, of doing LGBTI stuff. And most of that was within schools. Um, a lot of that was in regional and rural schools, particularly in Tasmania and and, and Victoria. And, and one of the, the lucky things that happened to me is I happened to be working with um, a Dutch government funded LGBTI organization. And I was the Australian representative and we were basically flying around the world and, and finding out from developing countries what we could learn about their their ways of, of um, I guess, supporting LGBTI people and making change and educating and raising awareness. Um, and I remember that I was um, I was running this this meeting. So I was asked to um, facilitate a worldwide meeting of expert practitioners and academics in schools. And one of the most intimidating things that I've ever no, done. It's really incredibly <laughs> daunting to say the and least. I'm just like, what, you're picking I'd me? I'd be freaking out too, um, yeah. So, so, so within that freaking out, um, um, part of part of what we were doing was um, the Dutch government um, organization was saying to these countries, all these developing countries, if you can come up with a national project, um, we will fund it. Um, so come up with a concrete. So I was working with um, all these different representatives having a great time and then i think it was day three or four and and um you know there was there was um linda from latvia and there was janica from estonia and they cornered me at you know at morning tea and they said you know daniel you're the facilitator and you're asking us about the national projects and no one's asking you like what would you do if you had an you know a national project to make a difference and i remember without without um any delay i said i would drive around the country I would collect people's stories and I would share all the resources of what I know works in, you know, schools mm. and rural communities. And after I said it, I was absolutely shocked because I thought I'd never thought about this before. I'd yeah. never, never, never realized that that was a project that I wanted to do. And immediately I, I kind of felt a little bit sick because I thought I was excited, but I felt a little bit sick because I just went, well, I don't have a truck and that's not possible and I don't have funding. But over the next 18 months, it just ate away at me. And then I realized that the more I was flying around the world and doing these these projects, I thought, um, you know, rural and regional Australia, this isn't being discussed. Something needs to be done. Um, I sat down and spoke to my mum. My mum, by the way, also thinks that I'm going to be, I'm going to die through my work. Um, 
every <laughs> every day. It's a very Harvey <laughs> Milk esque uh, yeah. scenario well, well, going well, on. Well, there. well, she's she's she she like she like she like she well, before I I so I I sat down with her and I said, look, I want to I want to do this project, but I'm not sure. And she said to me, love. Um, is anyone else going to do it? And I said, no. And she said, well, how would you feel if in three months' time you heard someone else was doing it? And I said, well, I'd, I'd burn because I, just, I, I <laughs> yeah, want to do this. And she, and she said, she said, all right. She said, well, well, you need to do this. Um, but she also, as I was about to get into that, that, that truck and, and make the drive, she told me through tears how scared she was. But she said... I know, I know my son and I know that you have to do this. I know that you, you, you have to do this project and I know the difference that you have made, um, in people's lives and I want you to, to do that for more people. But please be careful. And I, I can tell you that, that it was the second most scary moment of my life is jumping in that truck because it was self-funded. Mm. Um, I did, I sincerely didn't know if I was going to be able to, um, sustain myself financially going around the country. Um, and also, let's be honest, I, I had no idea that people would want to have conversations in rural communities. Yeah, if, was that unknown of what the conversations were going to be like and, and how they were going to be received and I guess even what you were going to say in those conversations too. Or even if I could find people to talk to, you yeah. know, all of these things were all of the great unknowns and it was, it was, um, you know, it, the, the overwhelming message that I received as I went around the country was it's about bloody time. You know, it's about bloody time that we have these conversations in our communities. Yes, they're uncomfortable, but there are a couple of facts remain. And one is we know that, you know, rural suicide, in particular rural youth suicide, where LGBTI people, you know, are way, way overrepresented and, and communities would have these, these, um, these stories to share and, um, you know, these, these, you know, and that they would see it as tragedy and needless and unnecessary, but often that was after the fact. Yeah. Um, the, and the other, the, the other fact that they talked about was we know for a fact that we have a bunch of young people who don't feel that they can be themselves. So they move away. Um, and it, and it made a lot of people angry and upset that there were a whole bunch of people and, you know, rural communities feel the loss of, you know, great people anyway, but, mm. but to, to feel this consistent loss of young people was something that, you know, they, they communicated really strongly. One of the quotes I came across, uh, from writing themselves in series, Latrobe, there are strong links between homophobic abuse and feeling unsafe, excessive drug use, self-harm and suicide attempts. Mm. Um, tell me a little bit about what you've noticed regarding that in these rural areas. The thing that I would say about the, like that research that was, that was, you know, probably the first bit of research that put all of those bits together, yep. um, is that, you know, I hear so often about the, the impact of people feeling unsafe. Mm -hmm. So we know that LGBTI people will, will, um, you know, face high levels of, of violence, abuse, discrimination, harassment than their heterosexual counterparts. Um, but I think the tale that, that, um, isn't, necessarily told is that um if people don't experience it themselves then they've they know people who have or they've heard stories particularly in rural towns you hear these stories um and or they live in fear of it happening to them so yeah. we talked before about the modification of their behaviors yeah. and so all of those things of of you know um you know particular people and again this is not the experience of every person living in regional rural and remote australia but for those people who are feeling unsafe they feel like they're the only one they feel like they're not they might have to move um that lack of safety is again under that rural spotlight you know they'll talk about um it being exhausting mm. like it's just absolutely exhausting and the toll that that takes you know second guessing everything not being yourself and the and how that just wears away and chips away and chips away um you know, a young person once described to me, you know, um, he said, um, homophobia to me is like the death of a thousand cuts. Um, it's not one big incident that does you in. It's not one big, you know, like, you know, something dramatic like a, you know, like a bashing, whatever that might be. He, he said, you know, what, what it is for me is all those small comments and hurts and assumptions and, yep. you know, stereotypes and all of those things that just build up over time until one of those brings that house of cards crashing down. You know, and, and, and so too, and I know that we'll talk about this, um, you know, people ask me about my, de you know, definition of community and I'll always say it's the accumulation of small kindnesses mm -hmm. over time, you know, and they can't erase all of those small hurts, but they can negate them. Um, and they can give people those signs of hope. And, and certainly, um, you know, again, I'll, you know, reiterate that 
that lack of safety and the lack of safe spaces in rural and regional um, places is something that gets to people over time. It accumulates over time. It's not necessarily one media article or one incident in town that's going to do it on its own. So let's let's have a little bit of a chat then about the work that you've been doing. Mm-hmm. More recently with Niche, tell me a little bit about Niche and what it is that, that Niche offers. So Niche really came out of my drive around Australia and, um, you know, the, the fact that there are LGBTI friendly voices that say we feel isolated and I heard this again and again and I thought, well... Um, how can we, how can we, um, you know, share resources and ideas and, and, um, you know, stop people feeling like they're, they're isolated. Um, the other thing I observed about LGBTI work is it, it tends to be very fiercely, um, state and territory based. Yeah. Um, we don't really have great national structures at the moment. I know that, that, that we're in conversation about that. Um, and so one of the things I observed was, you know, people in Ballarat and Bendigo probably had more in common with people in Bathurst, for example, you know, like mm-hmm. someone in Byron Bay can talk to Broome. Um, you know, there, there are all of these opportunities for like communities to speak with one another. Um, and then the, the model that people presented to me was, you know, my only choice is to go to the big smoke. So, so too, funnily enough, with LGBTI people, I, you know, it's this forced choice. I have to go to the big smoke. I have to go there. They won't go here. They're too scared to come here. Or someone came here 10 years ago and they haven't been back since. Um, so very much I wanted, I wanted to, um, you know, create an entity like, you know, it's almost like a gathering spot for people, resources and ideas yeah. about how do you do rural and regional engagement really, really well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so where that probably started was, um, you know, with my work in Tasmania and Victoria, um, you know, we've been to places like Mount Isa in Queensland, you mm-hmm. know, when I was driving around the country, people said, you know, why the, why the F would you go to Mount Isa? There's nothing effing there. Um, you know, places like Bunbury, um, in WA. And the, the, the reasons why I work with these communities is because they have, they have hope there. They have individuals who go, we want something to be different. Can you please come and work with us? Um, and build that up over time. Um, and, and what you, what, what I find is, is that when you go to these places, it's really strength based stuff. I, I, you know, people will often, you know, talk about it, you know, like it, it, it makes me laugh sometimes. They think I'm, I'm doing something radical or I'm gay Superman or whatever it is. But what I'm, go- all I'm doing is going into towns, um, talking with as many different people as possible, finding out what the strengths are, what, what's the low hanging fruit, what are some of the things that we can do to send signs of rural LGBTI hope to all the people who aren't out mm-hmm. and connected and supported right now. Um, and what are the messages if I'm talking to mainstream, you know, services and schools and police and hospitals and all the places that I go is what can they do to send messages of LGBTI inclusion? What are the things that they can tweak and do? And, you know, luckily um, through the work of many other people, through all of the interviews I did when I was driving around the country with both mainstream um, folk and also with LGBTI people is to say, what makes a difference? And so it's kind of like this this action-based learning where I've just got all of these different strategies and ideas and things that people say, this, this is the stuff that works. Mm. You know, yes, it's great that we have rainbow ticks. Yes, it's great that we have safe schools. But here's stuff that you can do right now. You don't have to, you know, spend a lot of money, go through way too, you know, like like a lot of professional development. All of that is essential over time. But here's stuff that you can do in the meantime before all of that gets approved by boards, before you get funding, before that the the training's booked in. Um, and and there are things that every single community can do that's low hanging fruit. And there's there's not a community they go to, there's not a you know, a school or an organization they go to where if you present these ideas to them where they won't themselves identify the things that they're going to do and the the things that they're going to change. And and, and and in terms of and in terms of what Niche is doing, I, I think that that um, it's taken a step up in the last couple of years. So, um, you know, Niche has um, been asked by the Victoria's Commissioner for Gender and Sexuality to, you know, partner partner Ro Allen in the LGBTI Equality Roadshow. So what that's meant is we've been going into towns, and rather than just talking with LGBTI people 
allies, other people who work with them. We've now got the situation where we've got a really good model that we can see what happens when you have decision makers and influencers in towns in the same room as LGBTI people and allies. And um, there's something there's something magical that happens when you have all of those people in the room for the you know for the first for that time United cause, yeah. at the same time with that for the first time on the agenda um, and that, you know that focus with a commissioner a commissioner looking on. Mm. How long do you find it generally takes for that shift to occur within small town communities? So we're, we're so at, at the moment we're eighteen months through the work of you know um, the commissioner and and you know what I find is that I do three visits to communities before the commissioner arrives mm-hmm. to. Um, when, when Ro comes into town, we do a bunch of workshops. So I do LGBTI, you know, 101 inclusion, you know, um, we do community inclusion planning sessions. So that's where you get everybody into the same room to say, what's the low hanging fruit? What can we do? And then we follow up three to six months later. Um, and that's the phase that we're at where we can really start to say, what's the differences between those communities that, that continue on the work? And those that don't. Now, in that, that's talking about changing um, the narrative in the town, sometimes the way in which it's discussed in the local media. Mm-hmm. Um, we make sure that we have local government involved. We make sure that we have service providers involved. But but what's probably, um, you know, I'm sure many of your listeners could understand, it's the stories of individuals. So, yeah. you know, um, these are people who, you know, it's really important to us that we make space and we make room for local voices mm-hmm. in that. So it's not just a kind of dry 101 kind of, you know, workshop. It's that locals get a chance to tell their story. And, and what strikes me is that, um, they get, they get 10 minutes to share their story, what it is that they'd like to share with, um, their local community. And people have said, this has changed my life. Um, we've got people who are, you know, whether it's, you know, young gay people, older trans women, um, you know, you know, bi people, whatever that might be, who will say, this has changed the way that I see my town. Um, it feels like things have changed here. And for the first time, I feel like I'm welcome and that I belong. Uh-huh. Um, now, now, um, if anyone tells you that they've got the formula about how to do that, I think they'd be lying, but yeah, we know that no way possible. Yeah. We, we, we know through this process that that can happen for people. Mm. Um, um, you know, we know that when you have the the community and business leaders in towns who stand up and say, you're welcome, um, and they do that explicitly for the very first time, um, we know that if people have had not great experiences with their communities and suddenly they're hearing that from the big parts of town, um, you know, it's as simple as I know someone who, you know, has been invited for cuppers at the local neighborhood house. Um, and just that alone has been really like this, this slow kind of trust building exercise with the community. And this is just, again, you know, as I was, you know, I've said before is small kindnesses, you know, small kindnesses from a bunch of people is what it takes, you know, and, and, you know, people who have gone through, extraordinary challenges um you know in their community and you know even in some other places before they've come back the fact that a small group of people in their town um you know cups of tea smiles remembering their name yeah. saying day on the street all these things that they've never experienced before just makes a world of difference and i i'm the, that's what keeps me you know me motivated through this work when i you know sometimes see less than great things from humanity i also see people at their best and i see you know what happens when people respond to that and thrive do you see people who perhaps have their attitudes shifted through the experience of it more so i'm thinking on the other side there people who can have quite blinkered uh, homophobic attitudes or what has been done to help them to move their attitude across um the, the really interesting thing that's that's happened is that the that, that part of the narrative of regional and rural centres has been um, this idea that it's you know it's traditional, it's conservative, it's older people, and so therefore there's this there's this view that um, you know Australia will change when all the old bastards die out. Um, what we've seen is a whole bunch of people who older people in particular in rural and regional areas who have come along and said um, you know. Um, I can no longer put my head in the sand on this issue. So this was this is what before the postal survey happened. Mm. You know, people saying I can't put my head in the sand about this any longer. So I've come along to learn, and the fact that there's a commissioner in town, and it's you know, then there's state government, etc., and you know, there's a Victoria Police bus. This means that we can um, 
uh, we can come to this with some safety and certainty, whereas before they they might not have they, they might not might have felt that they were at risk of saying the wrong thing or yeah. getting into trouble or in, invading on space. And I found that really interesting. What they've said is is that it's it's um, purely just getting things like the research evidence and the numbers. Like people just going, I had no idea about you know how many there were and and what their experience was and what it means and i've never heard someone tell their story before and um it, it's almost like um people have had this experience of lgbti people have been the other mm. and you know we know exposure theory you you know you have a chat to someone all of a sudden you go you know shit they're not so bad and yeah. um gee we ha actually have some things in common and um you've you've challenged some of my stereotypes and and what does that mean so we, we've had a bunch of people who it's it's purely it's it, it goes back to my days when I was in um, working in schools and um, you know we had some some incredible results where you know students attitudes did change and people were so interested because they were convinced that that they were convinced that you know I was going into a classroom and changing attitudes and I was and I was very very quick to point out that what I'm doing is, um, you know, you've got these people who have had these myths and stereotypes, but they've, it's really been a vacuum of good information. Mm. What I present, my job is to create a, a, you know, an emotionally safe space where you're able to present this information to them and say, here's the information, it's beyond doubt. You do with that information what you will. And invariably what happens is that they just go, shit, I didn't know that this you know th th this has given me a completely different view and cognitive dissonance does the rest i can yeah. you know there's, there's there's not you know i i can't hold these two ideas you know um in my mind and that's when people go oh wow and they'll they'll say things like and i still remember i had students at the all boys catholic school going oh wow gay people are just normal they're just like us and all the rest <laughs> of it and i thought i thought if if anyone if anyone and you know they started off by saying you know like they like all of these incredible things about that that incredibly challenging negative things about about gay people before we started the the, the work the program with them um, but, you know, I think people thought that, uh, you know, some of the opponents, uh, you know, religious opponents were thinking I was going in and saying, you know, kids repeat after me, gays and lesbians are normal, mm. you know, they're just like us, etc. cetera. But that, that were words coming there. And, and, and I think that the more, I mean, I mean you know, we know from, we, if, if you do a, a meta-analysis meta of all of the things that have worked, and changed attitudes and shifted things. They'll say, you know, you can spend money on billboards and policy and legislation change and, you know, media and all the rest of it. But the thing that matters most is where you have someone who comes out to you, where you have a significant ongoing existing relationship. Mm. That's the thing that shifts people. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's, you know, we know that. And then the second best thing seems to be is that if you can create an emotionally safe space, and we've seen this in developing countries, we've seen this in, you know, high income Western um, countries as well, is where people are able to, you, you have this safe, safe, ish space as safe as you can make it where people are ready to hear a story and then you present those stories to them um and that that's the stuff that works wonders because we know that that stories stories change hearts and minds but not in all cases it's when people have a readiness to hear that story mm -hmm. um and you can't always manufacture that but you can bloody try yeah Absolutely. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it does feel like with a lot of the younger kids nowadays that their attitude towards homosexuality uh, has shifted quite significantly anyway. It doesn't seem to be that, you know, you've obviously written uh, that's so gay. You know, I've even heard instances recently of someone on tram where someone said that's so gay and one of them turned around and said, you can't say that anymore. Yeah. And and we're coming from a genuine place there of, of calling him out on it. Yes. Uh, which is, to me, was so heartwarming to hear that. Mm. Um, have you found that regionally as well? Um, look, look, uh, I've been lucky enough to be working with young people for the last 20 years. And I, I, I think I probably have a different view on it is that mm. is that um, I, I've seen... I've worked with so many groups of young people where um, they've either been supportive or not from the outset. Um, and that has a lot to do with, um, you know, the context of the school, you know, family upbringing. We know all of yeah. that, all of that, right? Um, there is no doubt that there are more good stories than ever before. Mm. 
Um, however, what we see when we look at the research is that the impact of homophobic and transphobic abuse, um, discrimination, harassment, violence on young people is at its highest within schools to this day. It's still within oh, schools, still within young people. So we're not seeing those. This is the thing that I think is going to be interesting in the, in the wake of the postal survey. Yeah. Um, is that you've got you you've got a chance to measure things and compare and and what we're seeing is that those those levels of uh, abuse discrimination and harassment are not changing okay we're also seeing that that um i think the reporting has gone up so reporting of those instances have gone up across for everybody whether they're young or old um but but i don't see um I don't see evidence um, in the research, but anecdotally, we hear more and more stories. So anecdotally, we hear more and more young people are coming out. Anecdotally, we hear things like, you know, you you talked about the, the public transport experience. Yep. Um, regionally and rurally, we know that, again, um, you know, one of the best things that can happen, and, it's, and you know, I wish that I, I, I wish this upon every young person, but you know, you, you have these pockets of young people who just decide that they're coming out in spite of the school environment and you hear about those stories and you go, hang on, this can't be happening. It's in, you know, Ballarat or Bendigo or, you know, Kerrang or Swan Hill or whatever it is, but it's a group of young people that, that support one another. And if you've got, you know, four or five of them, um, they can, they can, they can drive a narrative within a school and they can also, lead school so we've we've heard plenty of stories about where schools have signed up for safe schools or decided to do some lgbti work um because of a group of you know students mm. but what i will say and i think this needs to be said is that we've 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 heard those same stories for the last 20 25 years as well it's just we hear more of those yeah. and i think that the more that we have uh, you know, I think that the postal survey will make a difference, and and we, you know, that's notwithstanding the impact that that had on people, young, old, you know, every section of the alphabet, in different ways. Um, but uh, yeah, I I I don't see the significant shift in that that I would like to see, and the research still has um, some way to go. What impact do you think the the, the same sex marriage survey has had? in these areas um i think it's um if we take away the impacts of of what i think it, it's meant for lgbti people of all ages and mm. i and i i've heard and and i can uh, you know i can say across um, particularly regional rural um uh victorian tasmania it's been clear that it was detrimental yeah um the biggest impact for me that I've seen is that, um, so too, like the word I was talking, it's like the work I was talking about with the commissioner is that in regional and rural Victoria and Tasmania, and you know we saw this across the, the country too, is that allies came out in ways in which they hadn't before. Mm, absolutely. So, so for me, the story, the story was that there was this momentum that was built of allies and it was allies who, who did not have to stand up, weren't necessarily asked to. I know that there were campaigns to get people to come on board, but there were a whole bunch of businesses and organizations and workplace and schools and, you know, um, um, groups that, that stood up in support of, marriage equality that we hadn't heard of before. Um, and it, it kind of became, you know, this thing of momentum. And um, for me, you can't, you know, regardless of what the result of the postal survey was, you can't put that back. You can't take that back. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it was very, very public. It was in a very, very, you know, heightened emo emotive time. And that makes a difference. People, people do notice that. And I'll be... I'll be interested in the stories that will be told for the next probably decade yeah. and all the research that will be done and people will go, this is where it changed for me. I heard, you know, um, I heard, you know, you know, this particular business or leader or whatever it is stand up. I mean, I, I used to find it remarkable when I was working with young people back in the day in Geelong, um, you know, 20 years ago. And, and, you know, you've got these, these young people that have been in school for, for 13 years, <laughs> You know, 13 years and and it's kind of like this desert. And then I talk to them about, you know, um, you know, what sustained you, you know, what got you through, um, you know, what, what can help trying to get these clues for, for, you know, for future, you know, students and young people. And they'll 
all have this one story. And that one story is, um, you know, like school was a desert, it was bleak, it was grey. But then one day my teacher said, or then one day a particular, you know, like the principal got up and said, and it would be something about diversity or inclusion, or it would be about, you know, gay people, or it would be about something, whatever that might be. And knowing that that was a sign of hope and something that like this oasis in the desert that they just grabbed hold of and they wouldn't let go. And that sustained them for the rest of their school career. And it made them, made them think, well, maybe not everybody in this school is like that. And I think that, I think that we'll hear stories like that. Mm -hmm. We'll hear stories of where people said for the first time I heard people standing up and saying something. Um, and it made me, it made me believe that it was more okay than it ever was before. Did you have an experience like that when you went to school? Um, look, I had a really, um, uh, I, I had a really, really tough school experience. Um, my, my sign of hope was my, um, my best friends came out to me mm. as bisexual. So I really, um, yeah, I really struggled with the way in which other students, I, there were two things. I went to a, um, I call it the Bronx of Geelong. Um, God love mm -hmm. them. Um, the Northern suburbs. And, uh, there were two things at my school that people didn't want you to be. And one was gay and one was smart. And right. both those things, I was visibly possibly both of those. And, and, um, as an introvert, I tried very, very hard to hide in the background, but it, it just, you know, if teachers are asking you questions or making, you know, comment or whatever that be. And I, I think that I was too sensitive and, um, you know, they, they would say too sensitive and, and mm -hmm. I was too emotional for the, the stereotypical boy. Um, but yeah, I had a, I had a, a best friend come out to me and he said, look, I've got something to tell you I'm by and please don't hate me and don't stop being friends with me. And I said, that's fantastic. Cause I'm gay. And he just goes, oh, that's so sweet. And I'm like, what do you mean that's so sweet? And he said, oh, you're pretending to be gay in order to make me feel better. And, <laughs> and I went, are you, are you serious? Like, are you really serious? I mean, come on, you know this. And and um, and so that that was a sign of hope for me. And and look, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. There are, there are two things that probably, um, you know, I'd, I'd say probably saved me, you know, going through high school. And um, um, one was that... Um, um, I, I believe that there was nothing wrong with me and I still don't know where I got this idea from, but I thought me being gay is not a problem. Um, my problem is, is that I don't want to be kicked out of home and I don't want to be beaten up by everybody else mm. and all the rest of it. So I was really clear. I didn't sit there like I, for some reason, I did not have this self -loath loathing. I didn't hate my gayness. I just hated the fact that I had a context that didn't support that. And then the other thing I had, and, I, and again, I, I still don't know where I got this from, but I had this, I had this, um, it was like this dream or this fantasy. And I just thought, like, I remember thinking one day I'm going to be in my thirties and it's going to be okay. One day. And it was like, it gets, before it gets better, came yeah, out there. Well, it was, it was, it was yeah, it's better. premonition of that. But, it, but even that, that idea, it was like, you know, I would have been 14, 15, 16. And I was thinking one day in my thirties, it's going to be fine. And I'll look yeah. back on this and I'll just go, you know what? And, you know, Thank, you know, even though I'm not really just thank thank heavens for small mercies, but it was mm -hmm. it was it was I just had those two ideas, and I wonder what might have happened if I didn't have those because I know that that you know for some people they you know, they don't have that. Mm, there is a lot of self loathing that goes on out, and I, I guess that really depends on how flawed they feel or how much potential shame they're carrying for that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think uh, a similar experience for you, uh, perhaps when I was in school, you know. Uh, I didn't know I was gay necessarily at the time, but certainly I could feel I was different from all the other guys. And worst of all, the other guys could feel that I was different from them as well. And that kind of drove that whole feeling of not being the same. In country areas, is that is that amplified? I think for the reasons that, you know, I've described around the rural spotlight is that it can be amp amplified. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the other things that happens in um, country communities is that, you know, sport becomes incredibly important. Mm. Um, and, you know, so too, if you, if you, if you don't participate in sport, you miss out on all the benefits. Okay. So, so people will go, well, if you don't like sport, who cares? But if you don't play sport in the town, people notice, yeah. um, like they notice, you know, like, you know, the fact that you're other or you're different, whatever that might be. Um, and so what it does is it, it, it again, you know, it, it denies 
a person an opportunity to participate. I, I still remember, you know, when I was growing up, my, my father and my older brother, you know, as macho and masculine and, you know, like, you know, the, um, you know, we're, we're very, very popular and charismatic. And, um, I, I just wasn't that. And I found that every time I went to football or cricket, what happened was, is I had to encounter the, you know, the macho bullshit as I described at the time. Um, and the, and homophobia, you know, and the fact that this was just, this was, this was even more of a spotlight on me potentially being gay or, or different or other. And so what I did was I chose to, opt out of that you know and it wasn't because i didn't enjoy football or cricket it was i didn't enjoy the context and i didn't think that i was going to be safe or okay in those environments mm -hmm. and i would rather you know and and people you know like my family still laughs about it is i used to go home and play um you know video games and and read books but that was kind of that was more about not wanting to deal with homophobia as opposed to i was you know i, I hate sport or i can't yeah. do sport right um um yeah, I forgot where I went then. <laughs> Sorry, that's the first time I went off on a tangent. We're talking about uh, amplification of um, yeah. So so so, yeah. so 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 again, I just think I just think um, um, it, it can be amplified, and and what it does, it just exposes another way in which you're not participating in the town, and and you know, I really I really think about this when I you know um, um, you know it's. Not every tragedy in a country town is a suicide, but I think it can you know like create these these examples where. Um, you know, country towns will go, we've missed out on the contribution of a, of a person here. Mm -hmm. So we've just, we've missed out. So whether someone moves away or they're suicide or whatever. Um, um, and I think that, you know, people, people miss out when people aren't contributing in rural areas. Um, and sport, sport and rural areas is probably one of the most intense spotlights that can be burnt on a, you know, an LGBTI person who doesn't necessarily feel safe or okay. Um, yeah, with, with their place in the world. Mm -hmm. If someone is uh, listening to this and they're from regional areas and they're perhaps feeling uh, unsafe or perhaps feeling that they're, they're the only gay in the village, we keep coming back to that yeah. infamous little Britain phrase, um, what can they do? What, what, what can they do to find a connection or to a bit of a community? Look, I, I, I think that, um, I mean, the first, the first very important point is to, is to let people know that they're not the only one. And I know that that's, um, um, you know, I, I'll often say that to people and they go, well, of course, everybody knows that, you know, of course there are LGBTI people everywhere. But just to say, I, I have been to every nook and cranny. If you're listening in Australia, I've been to every nook and cranny of this country, every corner. I've been to goodness knows how many small spots. There are LGBTI people who are in those country towns and they're both thriving and surviving. You can thrive or survive or just be barely surviving in Sydney and Melbourne, just as you can in some remote, you know, kind of small distant place. So for me, for me, um, I'll talk firstly with the, the aspiration, the, the, the ultimate, what, what it is that you'd like to have that. I've collected lots and lots of stories of LGBTI people across the country and, and said, what, what works for you and what, what, you know, why are you thriving in these country communities where other people might, might not be? What is it? And I'll give lots and lots of answers, but the one that, that shines through that each and every one of us can grab is that the people the people who thrive will say invariably, I have four or five people in my life who are supportive of me. So we know that in the months leading up to someone coming out, it's the most at risk time for them, for their mental health and well-being. We know that one of the most damaging times can be if, so, if you come out to someone and they have a negative response. But if you have someone who's supportive of you, then already you have this incredible benefit for your mental health and well-being. Then if you have two people, three people, four people, five people, it makes such a difference. So five supportive people in your life. Um, and they are ideally from different spheres. So one might be a friend, one might be family, one might be sports, one might be school, one might be workplace, whatever that might be. So it means that you kind of have this foundation of support that you wouldn't otherwise have. And then people will go, okay, well, it's nice to have people around you, but so what? The reason why I believe that those five supportive people become important is that 
Um, we know from research that if you live in Australia today, and hopefully this will change over time, but if you live in Australia today, it's inevitable that you will experience everyday and casual homophobia, biphobia, intersex and transphobia, okay? Um, no one's immune to that. It's how you respond to that. It's how you manage it and the support that you get that is absolutely key. So if you experience that and you don't have supportive people in your life, um, there, are, there is the chance that you might internalize that, that you might take that on board and go, that's just because it's the way that it is and that's the person I am and maybe I deserve that, etc. and it spirals. But if you have five supportive people, you can go, I experience um, you know, this homophobia and transphobia. I do not like it. I wish it wasn't the case. However, I've got five people in my life who remind me that it's not my issue, it's the other person's. So I'm not the problem, it's the context. The homophobia and the transphobia is the problem, it's not me. And those five people in my life remind me of that. Now, of course, um, when I when people say, well, what's what's something I can do to support LGBTI people? It's, it's you know, ask them, do, does anybody else know about you? Do you have other supportive people? If they don't, then you have, you know, who are some other people who you might come out to? Mm. What might be your plan to tell them over time? You know, you, you don't say to people, like, run out, run out right now and tell the first four people that you see that you're, you know, that you're... Um, LGBTI, but it's just to it's just to say, you know, if we know that these are foundations and this is important, how can we build that in over time? Now, if you're in a country town and you're going, well, that's that's all nice and well, but I don't know who it is that you know. I can have those conversations with. Who can I trust with this information? Yeah, you know, we know we know that there's there's two places people can go now. Now, um, um, the first would be um, for those who have heard of Q Life. So Q Life, Q L I F E dot org dot au. Um, in particular, you know, Victoria and Tasmania, we have Switchboard Victoria. It's a whole bunch of services who are there. Mm -hmm. And they might be the, you know, the person on the other end of the phone or the web chat who you can talk to. You can have a chat to. And then you might talk to them about, you know, what are some of the other resources that might be available. And, you know, we often know that they have a good, they have good databases. There might be something in your, in your town. If there's not, um, you know, we know that in, um, you know, in every pocket of Australia, there are signs of hope. Um, there are signs of rural hope and there are supportive people. I've met them in every corner. Um, it might be that they just, um, they themselves aren't that visible and open about it. But um, supportive people are in every, every, you know, corner of this country. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, so, so, so something like a Q life or, you know, a, a, a phone call or someone on the other end of the phone might be, might be one of those five supportive people, but it doesn't mean that you don't need those real people in your life. Mm. Then the, the, the second thing I'd say is that, um, you know, um, certainly the online communities can be, um, a source of support for people, but at the same time, um, we know that also online can be a, a place that's not great yeah. um, for people as well. So, so um, again, there'll be other podcasts you can listen to and other things that you can read about that if you if you want to know more. But that um, online is a really good place to be um, when um, when you're seeking out those support and those voices. Um, but the only thing I'd also say is that when, when you're, you're not necessarily feeling a hundred percent, um, you know, sometimes it's also good to step away from the computer and the phone. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if people want to support niche further, yep. what can they do? Um, they can go to niche, n i c h e dot org dot au. Um, people can donate. Um, you know, the other thing, it doesn't have to be monetary. Um, you know, people will say that they'll volunteer to do things within their own community. Um, people will suggest that their community might be a great place. We do leadership retreats with LGBTIQ people in rural areas. Um, we've seen some great outcomes in that. Um, I, I come to towns and do cuppers to do kind of like a, you know, like an assessment. And when I say assessment, I, it's not like me going, I give you, you know, seven out of 10. Checklist there. Um, <laughs> um, but it's more that I, I do an assessment about, um, what's in town and what the, what the state of play is in town based on based on local voices. So I kind of go, 
here's what everyone's telling me, here's what they're saying could could happen next. And and Niche has the resources to do that with a number of communities. And we've we've had lots of um um I guess we've seen movement and we've also had lots of fun and we've been able to give a whole bunch of people skills to support their family, friends and others in their own communities. So um please let us know if we can um do that. And the other thing is if you go to Niche you'll find out we've got some video clips and a few other resources that might be of help too. So um you know all free um go get them and and lastly for a man who's you know done so much whether it be you know prime prejudice program going around australia written uh three books is it now a uh, third book coming yes third book coming um what's next for you what's what's next on your horizon um get the third book out mm-hmm. um there's a fourth and the fifth that are in the in the works <laughs> um a bit but look for me for me it's about um um niche is in a um it was launched five years ago it's now at a point where it's being funded it's got government funding um for me it's about the next step is sustainability um so people go well you know i could be one one gay man in the truck challenging homophobic couple you know one cover at a time but for me creating this organization is about um again having a focal point for people ideas and resources and i really really want to have a sustainable not-for-profit um and the reason for that is that i know that that there are great things that are possible in regional and rural australia and I know that those things are possible and they don't rely on one person. And if they rely on one person or only a few, um, then that means that, um, you know, uh, the, the, yeah, it's, it's, we're not going to get as much great work happening as possible. So for me, it's about how can we get more people into the space, more people applying some of these principles which come from rural and regional LGBTI people and those that work with them. And how can we spread the love so that we've got more small, uh, small acts of kindness mm-hmm. and we're negating, um, you know, negating but not erasing a whole bunch of small hurts that have happened to people, you know, throughout their life journey. And um, I'll keep I'll keep going until they tell me to stop. Great. Well, I only hope our listeners out there who have felt inspired by Daniel give some small acts of kindness towards Niche as well. Um, Daniel, thank you so much for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, Thanks for listening as well. We'll be back soon with the next episode. Until then, take care.